Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So today we're going to talk about the archetype of the decision, which is a topic that's kind of been sitting on my list for a while. But then we periodically have polls where our patrons get to choose the topic. And I put the archetype of the decision on the list and it had the uh, biggest response. So we, we dedicate this uh, in particular to our patrons. Thank you for your support. And if you would like to help pick a future episode, you can become a Patreon too. Just go to thisjungianlife.com, click on podcast, and you'll see a link there to our Patreon. So what do we think about what a decision is? What does it mean in our lives? How do we make decisions? How do the decisions that we make determine who we become? So uh, that's what we're going to be circumambulating today. And one of the decisions that is coming to fruit for us is the decision to write our first book together, the three of us, Dreamwise, which is going to be published in, uh, in four days on November 11th. November 12th. And November uh, 12th, excuse me. Yeah. So um, we're, we're thrilled, we're uh, nervous, we're hoping that all of you will love it as much as we do. And we hope that you'll support us in jumping on and also giving us a review on Amazon. Yeah, that would be great. So this, of, of all the books I've written, I think this is the one I'm most proud of. I think we've done something really incredible here. And I hope you will consider pre-ordering now or wait till next Tuesday, the 12th, and you can order it once it's released into the world. And and Joseph, you're absolutely right. If you, if you love the book, a review on Amazon is always greatly appreciated or Goodreads. And, uh, and I'd also like to say that we're going to be doing a live podcast event around the book on November 17th. It's, uh, we're going to have giveaways and uh, sort of like a dreamathon. Lots and lots of opportunity for you to submit your dream at the event. We'll be picking dreams that were submitted at the event and talking about them, and we'll also be talking about the book. So put that on your calendar as well. The details will be in the show notes. And without further ado, let's begin talking about the decision. One of the things that was so challenging for me as we were wrestling with the topic is thinking about it as an archetype, mm -hmm. because there's a thousand choices that I may make in a given day, uh, I'll have this for lunch, or maybe not that, or I'll do one thing or another. But when I was challenging myself to try to define what is universal about the idea of the decision that would then cut across all those different areas, it has so many different dimensions to it that, that it was challenging to make it as crisp as I hoped it could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I couldn't make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that struck me about this and, and actually made me want to talk about it was um it was it was actually I think a tweet by one of our listeners and a colleague that I saw where she made the point that decision, the etymology of it, the the decision part comes from the Latin to cut. So it, it's literally to cut away, but it's the same etymology as suicide or homicide, the, the, the second part of the word. So to, we're sort of murdering the other options. We're, we're, we're cutting away the other options. We're, we're killing off the other options. And I think that speaks to the archetypal nature of the decision because it really does mean that we are, uh, it, 
lifts up, I think, why it can be so hard to make a decision because we don't want to have to kill off those other options. Uh, and, uh, and there can be a lot of kind of mournfulness about having to do that. You know, little things, but obviously big things too. I mean, one of the big decisions is who do you marry? And that is a real killing off of, the, of other options. Or, you know, what graduate program do you go to? Or what college do you pick? These things feel really big. And in a sense, they actually really are. I mean, if you marry person A versus person B, your life might be different. So uh, that there is that sense of having to um, countenance the fact that you're really closing a door on a potential version of yourself. Which brings up a certain kind of existential feeling as you say that, because to suspend a decision is to live in a world of limitlessness, and that if we think of the decision as cutting off the limitless options, there's something um, fateful, mortal, about saying, I, I only have so much time, energy, resource to pursue this person, not all persons, to pursue this career and not all careers. So there is that um, weightiness to, to the moment when we say this and not that. Yeah. You know, we've done two other podcasts, I think, that kind of touch on this. One, we did do a podcast on being indecisive, I believe, a long time ago. We also, a long time ago, did a podcast on um, the pu'er, this, this kind of archetype of the eternal youth. And, and that touches into it because I think one of the qualities of the pu'er is someone who can never commit to anything. And that when, when, when everything remains in, in potentiality, when life is all potentiality, but it hasn't, when you make a decision, you kill off all these potentials, you sort of prune them away, and you come into a specific form in time and space. You know, you, you become this particular individual. And uh, so the necessity of making a decision, of killing off other options, is part of uh, kind of growing down into our own life. And maturing, really, and not, not staying in this place of pure potential. Right, growing into reality, that kind of reality principle. Yes, yep. It also reminds me a little bit of uh, the Myers-Briggs typology, which is a little bit different from Jung's typology, because the Myers-Briggs folks added another dimension that they call the P or the J type at the end. And so J types... Uh, tend to be more decisive, and they find indecision to um, be tremendously anxiety-producing. And so it's painful and distressing to not finally just call the game. It's going to be this and not everything else. Well, people that have more of a P-type, prospecting type, for them to make a, a definitive decision brings on an enormous sense of loss because of all the other possibilities are suddenly not available. So we're also holding that tension between the anxiety of ambiguity and the grief of cutting away all the many possibilities. And um, it seems, based on the Myers-Briggs folk, it's about a 50-50 split <laughs> in terms of just human nature, which side we trend towards. But it's still brings up this great question of what is it inside of us that moves us towards a decision versus staying in some other softer um, place where we either don't or don't have to or refuse to actually make a decision? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about uh, people who really, really struggle with making decisions and how painful that is. And in our modern lives, we are asked to make so many decisions. And you know, there's research done about this, about decision fatigue. I remember this wonderful story, which I think is true, that 
Obama had like 10 black jackets and like 10 black, or when it was, maybe it was Navy, I don't know. But he had, he, he didn't want to have to make a decision about what to wear mm-hmm. because he, he was making so many other decisions. And they've, they have studied this and there is, you know, there's an ability, you know, the, the surgeon who goes through his day having to make life or death decisions about, you know, how to treat patients comes home and it's like, does not want to have to think about what to have for dinner. There's always a little, I mean, we love the, the idea of choice. But it also stresses us out. And when you go and you're going to buy toothpaste, you know, there's like, I don't know, 20 different kinds of toothpaste and, you know, breath freshener and it's going to whiten your teeth. It's going to it's going to do, you know, it's going to do everything but drive your car. And and it it can be kind of overwhelming. I, I totally relate to that. You know, I, I'm doing a little bit of a renovation work in one of my homes. I'm, and this is going to sound like a ridiculous example, but I have to pick the towel bars for the bathroom. And so, like, I click on Amazon and there's like 800 choices to make. And, and it's amazing that there's so much creativity and resource in the world. But that exact moment of what the hell is even the criteria? Or something like that. Where am I casting about? It's not a consequential decision, but it still speaks to this flood of images and possibilities, which is too much to actually sort through on a conscious level. Yeah, and I've certainly worked with people who, you know, their presenting problem is I have trouble making decisions. Mm -hmm. And you can feel the sort of exhaustion of that. So, you know, and what the research says, as I understand it, is it's it's better to just pick something and just pick something and move forward and that it probably doesn't make such a big difference what you pick. And it makes sense to me from a depth psychological sense, because when you're staying in the indecision, you're staying in that fantasy of pure, limitless potential. And that is a lovely place to be for some period of time. I think it's important to be able to stay there when we're young, for example. Uh, you know, there's some people who feel so anxious, they just want to figure out what their career is right away. And it's like, well, maybe take some time. Go, you know, get, go waitress for a little while and see what that's like. Don't, don't, you know, don't decide, oh, we've got to go to graduate school tomorrow, you know, because when I don't even know what I want to study, but I, I feel like I want to just collapse the tension and know. It's like, well, it might be better to just leave that open for a little bit. So there is a time to leave it open. But if you stay there indefinitely, um, it, it, it means that you never really live. I'm really thinking about the way that each of us has to discover how we set up a valuation system inside of ourselves. And sometimes we just don't have enough data. So we do need to perhaps go and wait tables or perhaps join the Peace Corps for two years and travel and, and wait to absorb enough facts about ourselves and the world in order to set up a criteria. So thinking types will uh, accumulate a lot of rational clarity about what decision or what option is more valuable. And feeling types have to discern what they like or don't like in increasing levels of intensity And both of those things take a lot of energy and a certain amount of exposure to the reality that one is evaluating. Mm -hmm. But like your towel bar decision, it's almost like, you know, past a certain point, it's like you just pick something, right? I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) And then then, then I'll complain about it, you know, for the next. In the next 20 years, like a goddamn towel bar. But, that, but that's an interesting point, though, because I think that, you know, part of making a decision is having to live with the consequences. That we're at the towel bar crossroads. <laughs> I was walking through a, through a woods darkly and <laughs> the path diverged and it was all, <laughs> my future was determined, consequences and risks and yeah. opportunity of the towel bar. but. But it is interesting that for some of us, something as um, small as a towel bar, which is a funny example, Mm -hmm. can take on um, a level of dread or import Mm -hmm. for reasons that can be very mysterious. 
to us. And that may be that the archetype of the decision has become its own complex. Yeah. Yeah, say more about that. Well, if we think about just the complex theory, just as you said, there are innumerable decisions, tiny and life-changing, that we have had to make in our lives. And, and all of those decision moments come together and satellite around the archetype of the decision. And if that has been a particularly fraught process, if we have a lot of really disturbing, painful memories around decisions we've made, it may be that when we approach even a small decision, that the entire complex begins to beat its drum and we begin to feel incredibly anxious as if it's as big as some of the decisions that haunt us. But it may just be a towel bar yeah. in the reality of the moment. Right. So I think if we have disproportionate anxiety or we act strangely around decisions, we have to be curious about our history around that and also even perhaps the history of our parents because how they orient to decisions gives us a sense of whether or not we can trust ourselves or trust the world. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things I'm thinking of is the way that um, you can make a decision, like I'm going to get this towel bar. And then, you know, there there may be a relief that comes with that, like, oh, thank God I made a decision on that. Now I can pick out the uh, tile or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but some of us second guess ourselves. So you get the towel bar and then you sort of undo the decision by, was that the right decision? Was that the right decision? What if I, re- what, maybe I, re- maybe that was the wrong decision. I, so I've known people, and of course, I mean, this is human. I've, I've done this. I don't do this routinely, but I bet every one of us has done this, where you make a decision and then you sort of torment yourself over it. And you go back and you reverse it and you think, oh, you know, and you waver and, and and again, I, there's something really unhelpful about that. There's something to be said for simply, simply saying, um, you know, this this is the decision I made, and I'm going to move forward with it. Even big decisions, I, you know, of course, like I like I was saying before, something like who you marry is going to be incredibly consequential because it's, you know, it's going to obviously uh, speak to your day to day happiness, but also in terms of like your health and your financial well-being. I mean, if you if you marry someone who's profligate with your money, you might wind up in really bad straits. That that happens if you if you get married, you're kind of tied together financially. Um so obviously there's things you can do to mitigate that, but that's sort of beside the point. It's it's a big decision, but at some point one can one can because one can't have perfect information about what's going to happen. You sort of have to take that empty handed leap into the void. You know, you have to do your, your due diligence. You have to look at as many towel bars as you can. And then you just <laughs> put one in the cart and click, you know, buy now. And, and then you tell yourself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live with it, you know, and, and hope for the best. And you don't really know. But the decision point, as we're talking about this silly example, that there are many different moments between when I click the button and it says that my my order has been delivered to to when it's finally screwed into the wall and there's my towel hanging at it. And so there is something unique to each person about what is the moment where it cannot be called back again. Yeah. Yeah. So there are times I've ordered something and then five hours later I'm like, oh, oh, and then I canceled the order on Amazon and then I'm, I need to think some more. Like for me, because the wall that it's going to go into is tiled, so I'm going to have to screw, drill through the tile, which will forever change the tile. Yeah. And so like the width of the towel bar, it's so costly to take that out and move it around and then you have this permanent hole in your tile. So there's something about the consequence or or how easily something can or cannot be retracted that gives us this feeling of there's no turning back now. 
You know, that brings up something else for me, which I think is the other side of this kind of flip flopping, Mm -hmm. which is um, sometimes when you make a decision, you have to manage the cognitive dissonance around the doubt. Mm. And so you become a sort of true believer that this is the best towel bar in the world. (laughs) No other towel bar would ever be possible. And you could even become a proselytizer for that towel bar because it feels really good when other people make the same decision we do. Now, obviously, the towel bar is kind of a uh, a silly example, but I'm thinking about, um, you know, a little bit of a personal example. Like if if you send your kids um, to a certain school, mm-hmm. you, you kind of, you know, it's such a big investment. You're you're handing your kid over to this institution. And it, it's something that, you know, I saw again and again when a parent would pick a school, suddenly that parent was like, the biggest believer in that school and that school, it was like, you'd ask the parent, what do you think of this school? And oh my God, it's the best. It's, I can't imagine any place better. And, and I would think really, (laughs) you know, because, but I think it's very human to do that. It, because uh, it, you know, Jung said, great quote, um, fanaticism is always a sign of a repressed doubt. (laughs) And whenever we're making a decision, there are always doubts. And if we've made a big decision, we may not have to want to have to think about the doubt. So we can torment ourselves with it and go back and see, oh my God, is there another towel bar I can get? And maybe I can have the whole wall retiled and, you know, but we can also just become, uh, kind of a true believer about the particular school we we sent our kids to or the towel bar that we that we bought. So uh, that's kind of maybe the other side. So so is there something about decisions and managing uncertainty? Mm-hmm. Because usually when we make a decision, there's there's something unknown about the consequences on either side that we're choosing between. And and we have to, that's a very difficult thing to bear up under. So that there's a way in which when we're making a decision, our imagination has something to do with this, our fantasy life has something to do with it. Again, using a very um, lighthearted example, I have some friends and we'll go out to dinner. I'm usually the guy that will try the thing I've never heard of. Ooh, squid ink pasta should be interesting. It was disgusting, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, uh, had but, it. I, <laughs> but I was like, oh, I'll try it. I have friends who will look through a menu and they're actually frightened to get a food that won't taste good. But what if I order it and it doesn't taste good? And there's something about the, the weight of that for them that, that is, um, carries an almost a traumatogenic energy for them. So there's something about, do we have faith or evidence in our own adaptability, our our own capacity to tolerate and make adjustments later on? Or do we feel like we make the decision and our feet are in a cement block now? Right. And that the stakes are high. Like, I won't enjoy my dinner. I might go home hungry, you know, which would be a shame if you were looking for a nice night out. But, um, you know, I once um, made a decision that I then flip-flopped on. And it's interesting to look back because I did undo the decision. And I look back and I think, I kind of wish I hadn't undone that decision. I was going to spend my junior year abroad in Italy at the University of Bologna. And I got to Italy. I got there. I was going to take a, a sort of an accelerated Italian immersion class, you know, before starting. I already spoke Italian, but I was going to speak it better before starting college at the University of Bologna. And I and I was there and it just sort of overcame me. Like I really was sorry to I think the biggest thing is I was really sorry to miss that year back at my university, which uh, it seemed like God, four years, each one is precious. I I didn't I didn't want to forego that opportunity to be on campus. But but I think it was a kind of um I think it was a kind of neurotic uh fear that I had. And I got myself all twisted in knots about it and decided that it was a mistake and I came home. And I, you know, if I'd done it, I would have missed that year. And that was uh that was a good year in many ways. There were opportunities that I had at, you know, on campus that I would have foregone. But, you know, now I would have had that experience to look back on and I, my Italian would be a lot better than it is. And 
I would have had this experience of living for a year in, in Italy. And, uh, you know, I, I, th I look back at the person that I was, and I think, yeah, that wasn't, I, I wish I pushed through that, uh, my, my, my neurotic fear about what I would be missing out on. So I think that was a little bit of a lesson to me. I don't think I've made that same mistake since. So that's good. And that, and that brings us back to the way that the, the complex can skew our ability to evaluate an option before us because we're not fully engaging the realistic or reality-based elements of what's occurring. And, and that's true for all of us. So part of making a decision, I think, is trying to weed out some of the distortions that we are holding inside of us and just as Jung said, we, dis we become suspicious of a distortion because our emotional intensity around the decision seems disproportionate to what's at stake. So, you know, weeping over whether you're going to get the fish and chips or the pork sandwich, um, or just feeling agonized by it, one might say, it seems a bit excessive. And so we have to kind of dig in and wonder, wow, what's interfering with my ability to just evaluate what I like or don't like? Which could be a rather simple situation. For instance, it may be that you're a guest and you're hung up trying to get a sense of what would please your host. Right. And so asking what you like or don't like has been subverted by a kind of authority complex about what's appropriate or pleasing. And then we're alienated from something inside of ourselves which could give us good information. Yeah. And help the ego make a true evaluation. And this is so much part of the individuation process that we are colonized by so many different agendas. And yet, in the middle of all of that, there is a, an authentic core that is able to chime in and give us a sense of what is more or less valuable. But we might feel genuinely ambivalent about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and there, it may, sometimes it doesn't feel like there's, there's something so clear. And I actually, I think one of my, one of the reasons why I made a poor decision then is because I was looking for like absolute certainty. Mm -hmm. And instead of being able to say, well, I don't really know. I don't really know what the year would be like if I went back to university. I don't really know what it would be like if I stayed here. Um, but maybe I can bear that uncertainty and, and just move forward. You know, maybe I can bear being ambivalent, not knowing if I'm going to like this good ink pasta. So what that brings to mind is what is the criteria that we are using in order to weigh yeah. something inside of us? And if we if we don't know the scale um, with which we're weighing something, then it's very difficult to know how to orient towards it. So is it about life? Oh, what's going to give me the most rich life experience? Or what's going to help me master Italian? Like if that was the scale of consideration, it would be very clear. Yeah, right. And I, and I think that... Um... You know, it, it, we also, sometimes we think it's a rational process, but as you said earlier, I think it's often really an unconscious process and a very emotional process. And, and I think that's why when we, um, you know, it almost requires being a little gentle with ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sort of just being able to tolerate that there's going to be some ambivalence. There might be some mourning, you know, like, like. Like, again, to go back to my experience, I mean, I had made this decision mm -hmm. and and just as we spoke about at the beginning with the etymology of the word, I had killed off this possibility of being on campus and I couldn't tolerate that or I felt like I couldn't tolerate it. But uh, but if I'd spoken to myself a little differently, I might have been able to say, you know, there's something you're not going to be able to do both. You're going to kill off something. And, and, you know, that's, that's hard, but maybe it could be okay. What I found myself thinking as you were uh, talking about that is the locus uh, of the energy to make the decision. 
So we have a rough division in, as Jungians between the ego and the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And the unconscious is kind of a landscape which can be populated with many things. And particularly when we're young, the ego or the conscious part of us can have a pretty big gas tank. Like there are things that the ego can do just because it's curious. The unconscious may have no interest in it at all or even dislike it, but we've got some muscle. And so we can drive the ego chariot in a direction just because the ego d decides it's going to do that. Mm -hmm. When was had decided to write memories, dreams, and reflections. There's, there's a section that's so important to me when I had read it, is that people had been asking him for many, many years to write an autobiography. And he said, I, I just couldn't. That when I looked inside of myself, and this is his language, I did not feel a gradient form. And I was, was and was at that time for him unable to initiate a decision or initiate action without the support of the unconscious mind. So for Jung, he imagined the inner world as quite literally a landscape, and that libido or life force or energy moved on the landscape much like water. And the way that water flows down towards the ocean, he would sense in himself as if the inner landscape had just slightly sloped and libido kept flowing down towards a project, an idea, a concept. And I believe it might have been an island who had asked him, you know, is, is he interested in looking at this again? And suddenly libido started flowing toward the project and then the ego found that it could ride on the flow of life force. Jung came to believe that it was not a conscious part of the personality that would decide where the energy would flow. It was something that one just had to notice. Yes. And again, as he had become older and even more fragile, he really needed that internal support to, to make himself do things and also there's perhaps an integrity and a privilege of old age to be able to say that I'm not interested in, in doing much of anything just because I've been asked to do it, because somebody else thinks it would be a good idea mm -hmm. for me to do it. Which goes back to the beginning of our conversation with, we have whatever limited resources we have at a given moment, internal and external resources, and we can't do everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Hello, listeners. We are really excited to invite you to a live podcast recording to celebrate the publication of our new book, Dreamwise, Unlocking the Meaning of Your Dreams. The event will be held on November 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and there's going to be a lot of fun stuff. We'll let our hair down with you. You can laugh along with us as we roll with bloopers in front of the live cameras. And a lucky few of you will walk away with the Dream Alchemist Toolkit. We really want you to join us in this mission of awakening people to their inner wisdom. And, and when you think of buying your copy of DreamWise, think about the people you could share that with and introduce them to a similar moment when you realize what your dreams really could mean. At the live event, we're going to be interpreting a lot of your dreams. It'll be kind of like a dream-a-thon. We're going to ask that you submit your dreams at the event. So come prepared. We'll be sharing a link, and then we'll be interpreting those dreams as we get them. So we hope you'll join us. Tickets are in the link, and we'll see you on the 17th. You know, um, Jung had an important decision to make in his youth, which is what to study. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't decide. And there's a, there's a great um, bit in Memory Streams Reflections, actually, that, that maybe I'll share a little bit of. Um, so uh, he had to get this decision. So he said, my father was very worried. He said once, the boy is interested in everything imaginable, but he does not know what he wants. I could only admit that he was right. 
as matriculation approached and we had to decide what faculty to register for, I abruptly decided on science, but I left my school fellows in doubt as to whether I intended to go in definitely for science or the humanities. And because he's young, he was helped with this decision by a couple of dreams. Um, I'll just read about the second one. He said, I was in a wood. It was threaded with water courses. And in the darkest place, I saw a circular pool surrounded by dense undergrowth. Half immersed in the water lay the strangest and most wonderful creature, a round animal, shimmering in opalescent hues and consisting of innumerable little cells or of organs shaped like tentacles. It was a giant radiolarian measuring about three feet across. It seemed to me indescribably wonderful that this magnificent creature should be lying there undisturbed in the hidden place in the clear, deep water. It aroused in me an intense desire for knowledge so that I awoke with a beating heart. These two dreams decided me overwhelmingly in favor of science and removed all my doubts. So, you know, sometimes we, we're looking for that certainty. And, you know, Joseph, you're, you're bringing up this, this wonderful thing about we just sort of listen for where, you know, where, where is the unconscious moving me toward? And sometimes that does come in a dream. I mean, I think I've had times when a dream made it really clear what I needed to do. For sure, I've had that. Um, doesn't always happen, though. Sometimes you're, it's really, you really have to just deal with it and the answer doesn't kind of magically pop down from the unconscious. And it comes to that, the quality of criteria. For instance, because I'm a, a feeling type, I can be very influenced by other people's enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. So I'll be talking with somebody and they're really enthusiastic and then they'll ask me a question and, and I'll be like, yes! And without realizing that I'm actually riding on their vitality. Yeah, and I think I've probably done that to you. Uh, <laughs> to good, to good end many times, but uh, but part of what I had discovered really by the time I was in midlife, by the time I was forty, forty five, is that my youth was kind of littered with projects that I had started, directions that I had taken, and gone two miles instead of a hundred, and I was tired of the litter. And so at a certain point, I made a decision with, kind of spoke to my unconscious, and I said, I will listen to anything. And if it seems like a good idea, I will put it in a little nest somewhere in my head. But I refuse to act on any of those ideas unless I feel absolutely sure that I'm going to be given the energy to bring it to a conclusion. Because I am tired of being left, you know, with an empty tank of gas halfway through a trip, and in many ways, I still I still use that criteria. It's a little bit like Jung's idea of the gradient, but for the most part, that has served me reasonably well. Because for me, the criteria is coming to its conclusion. Now, that's not everyone's criteria, but it was for me. Yeah, I've, you know, I've heard you say that before, and I've really taken it to heart because I think it's relevant. And another, uh, you know, this is, this is another place where decision comes up is um, if you're an intuitive, as I am and you are, and I, I have lots of other intuitives in my life, and one thing that's true about us is we get lots of ideas. And you, like, I get more ideas than I can do. Mm -hmm. And so there is that question, what? There is a decision. Do I do I try to run with this idea or do I not? Mm -hmm. And you're you're giving this kind of criterion according to which you can make that decision. It's like how much energy is behind it, which I really appreciate because I I think I used to kind of feel tormented that I couldn't do every idea, and, and then just like accepting that I'm going to have to kill some off. That's the decision again. I'm going to have to cut some away. You know, but that's just how it is. That's just how it is. It's a kind of pruning, pruning process. For me, the the binary of of killing or uh, living, which is in the word uh, uh, undoubtedly, the idea of a seed idea just staying in the nest, and maybe some seed ideas take twenty years 
to accumulate enough libido for me to trust that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. And I'm, I'm open to that, and I don't look at everything that's in the nest. It has to start making noise before I kind of remember that it's over there in the corner and it's, you know, been gestating. Going beep, beep, beep. Yeah. But I think discovering whatever our criteria is, Mm -hmm. is also part of that journey of self-knowledge. Yeah, and you're right. And I think that there's, um, you know, you mentioned before, like, my decision with Italy, what's the what's the overarching goal? Yeah. And I and I think that um, it's good to it's good to know that what that is. And, and, you know, there's it's a fairly small example is the is rich life experience, more time on campus, learn Italian. But even in a big way, you know, like if we're, let's say we're in our 30s and we have the, we have the potential maybe to choose a particular relationship, but on the other side, there are some things that maybe we're not thrilled about. But, but you almost have to ask yourself, um, what's, what's my big picture plan here? Not, not that you have to have everything planned out, but an awareness of finitude. You know, if what, if, if you're 36, you've got a, a good guy, but it's not perfect. You, you might have to say to yourself, you know, this is, uh, this is one path I could take. And, you know, the other path is over here. What, what, what are my higher values? Does it, does it matter to me to be married? Does it matter to me to maybe have children or, or is it more important that I listen to this other thing? But, but I think, um, you're really raising this important question, I think, about do we have a sense of you can only be loyal to a handful of ideas, plans, and values. You, you have to pick. And, uh, but if you know what those three or four things are, it makes all the other decisions easier. Still difficult, but easier. You know? And I think that the these um, guiding values, or Jung might even say attitudes, mm-hmm. are something that we discover, that, that they constellate deep down in the bottom of the personality, and that we discover it often by encountering the outer world in all these different ways that we do, and beginning to notice that we trend you know, in certain ways. And then upon reflection, we think, you know, I really seem to think safety is very important. Not good, not bad, but I really like the feeling of being relaxed and safe and contained. Just works for me. I'm at my best in those environments. And so then we kind of name that and then we can use that as one of many criteria to decide what we think will help us be the best version of ourselves based on however we decide that. But it is the experiment. Yeah. Yeah, it's your it's your experiment about what works for you, and what 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 matters. What matters to you? What matters most? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, and then and then if you know that, if you know that what really matters to you is, uh, let's say, it really matters to you to be partnered, then the concessions that you have, might have to make to be with this particular person feel okay. Because they're in service to this higher goal, you know? So again, like not good, not bad. You can have different values. But knowing what they are is helpful instead of trying, trying to actualize everything. Right. And that's often has something to do with intensity, uh, the relentlessness of it. And there are certain, there are certain seed ideas that rise up in us that demand actualization, demand being born in in a way that we live these things out. Now, um, I want to just hop over to Ian McGilchrist's work, The Master and His Emissary, that you know so well. Well. Is that based on this research about tracking neurologic signals uh, in real time, in the minds of people who are being studied, that we have a sense that our conscious mind has chosen something. Mm -hmm. 
and we have this strong sense of autonomy and and rationality about ourselves. But McGilchrist's research suggests that before the ego becomes aware of a choice, something in the right side of the brain has been activated. It starts sending out all kinds of information and signals. The conscious mind, without realizing it, is responding to a quote-unquote a decision mm -hmm. that's in the unconscious or the right side of the brain. And then its job is to set about having that experience or responding to it, actualizing this, what I would call a seed idea. Mm -hmm. This is also something that's very um, clearly held in some of the ancient mystery traditions, that, that something drops down into us from a transpersonal place, and that is the ego's job to discover that and then to bring it into fruition. But humanity has evolved in this fascinating way where the ego can act autonomously, mm -hmm. that we can disregard this deeper wellspring, and we are in this state of choice, which is suggested in the story of the Garden of Eden. Mm. When we are living in this perfect, quote-unquote, state, where we are walking in the garden with God or the self or whatever that transpersonal source is, you know, the will of the self and what the ego experiences is all congruent and there's no conflict in any kind of way. And then humanity, mythically, but also perhaps even in terms of evolving brain structures, separates out from instinct. And then all of a sudden, we could go in this instinctive direction or we could go in a different direction that is alien to anything that's inside of ourselves, which has allowed us to separate from the collective, which I think we could imagine it from an evolutionary bi uh, psychology standpoint, is that we're separating out from the flock mentality, that we're rising above the herd by discovering, I am discreet. I know differences. I can make distinctions that are not based on instinct or just unconscious impulse. And so we've had some eons of human beings being able to say yes or no mm -hmm. to that unconscious impulse. And perhaps we've gone too far, which I think is what Jung was saying, we've gone too far in preferencing the ego as the sole impulse to make decisions the unconscious, that right side of the brain, is still sending all kinds of information and signals when we ignore it. When it's powerful tension, we can become symptomatic. Mm. McGilchrist is suggesting that that right side of the brain is still talking, the unconscious is sending out all kinds of information, and that perhaps it's time for the ego now to look back at dreams back at the irrational, back at the seed ideas, back at the hunches, back at the signs and auguries, and consider whether or not the deep signal could be giving us information that the conscious mind has not initiated, but could still be the wiser, contextual, correct, best outcome information. Mm -hmm. So we needed this process of alienating ourselves from the irrational, becoming a discrete conscious creature, and then with more consciousness going back into that right side of the brain and inviting the dialogue again, which Jung called the transcendent function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And it, it makes me think um, I mean, this is a slightly different take on it, but I think I'm touching into some of the same things. Um, Jonathan Haidt in uh, The Righteous Mind talks about, he has the metaphor of the elephant and the rider. The rider is the ego and the elephant is the unconscious. And we all think we're the rider who's actually moving the elephant. 
but really the elephant makes up its mind. And then the ego justifies ex post facto. So we actually think we're in control mm -hmm. and we're making the decisions and pulling the strings when often we're, we're having an emotional response and we're not even, we're not even acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. So there's something here, Joseph, which I think you were getting to about uh, a different kind of relationship between the ego and the unconscious, where the ego ideally is open to the promptings of the unconscious, but, but perhaps is at least honest with ourselves about what we're responding to and, and, and able to evaluate the promptings that come from the unconscious, from, from feeling and intuition, perhaps a, a little bit more um, honestly, maybe. You said that so much more clearly than I was meandering around for the last 10 minutes. Well, it's That's complex. That's beautifully said. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's complex. You know, I want, I want to go to this idea a little bit. I was talking earlier about the relationship between the decision and the ability to um, tolerate cutting away, tolerate the death of options. And you had mentioned, you know, it has to do with the reality principle. I, I want to bring, there's a really great, some great quotes um, that, that I have here. They're both from um, uh, an Adam Phillips book. Adam Phillips is a British psychoanalyst. And he says, we have an inner need, a desire. We hallucinate, we fantasize its satisfaction. That is, we fast forward the wish fulfillment, and this is pleasant for a bit. But then we noticed that we are still in need, and the only way we are going to be properly satisfied is by finding what we want in the external world. Reality is our second choice, but our best option. So this is related to the idea of the decision, because oftentimes what we're deciding between are two or more less than ideal options in reality. So and and sometimes what prevents us from uh, making a decision is the fantasy. So, for example, we may not want to commit to a certain partner. I had a friend who was dating a man, and um, they were getting along great, like a house on fire. But he didn't want to propose. He didn't want to propose. He didn't want to propose. And and finally, she said, "You know what's keeping you?" And he rather sheepishly admitted that there was a part of him that still thought he might wind up with Christy Brinkley. This was a long time ago when Christy Brinkley was a supermodel. But, but, that's, but we all have that, right? Like, well, I could marry this real person here, or I could continue my fantasy that I'm going to wind up with, you know, someone who's really with some ideal, but, but, it, but it's really only a fantasy. So there's one more quote that I think taps into this. This, is, this again, is from um, Adam Phillips, and I just love this one. Anna Freud once said, in your dreams, you can have your eggs cooked the way you want them, but you can't eat them. The implication is clear. Magic is satisfying, but reality is nourishing. Oh, well said. Isn't that great? That's beautiful. And to quote our colleague, uh, Deb Stewart, um, want what you can have. But just that uh, salty, practical part of it is, let your mind go wherever it wants to go. Have your dreams. Think of whatever it is you choose. But at a certain point, we have to look at what is, what is possible and in reach. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if you would indulge me in a little bit of um, Marie-Louise von Franz. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this, is, she's this is her book, Puer Eternus. It's not, I think, a coincidence that this stuff about making a decision is in that book. Um, so uh, um, there's a motif from a Russian fairy tale that can illustrate the need to make a decision to kind of cut off the other options and how difficult that can be. And so now I'm reading from Louis von Franz. At a dinner party, the czar says that, that none of his sons had yet picked his flowers, so the three sons ask for his blessing and set out on the search. Each takes a horse from the stable and sets forth. All three come to a signpost which says, He who goes to the right will have enough to eat, but his horse will be hungry. He who goes to the left will have enough for his horse, but will himself remain hungry. And the one who goes straight ahead will die. So you have a decision to make. <laughs> 
The first brother would be robbed of the instinctual experience and therefore his horse would be hungry. The brother who goes that way finds a copper snake on a mountain. When he brings it home, his father is furious and says he has brought home something dangerous and demonic and puts him in prison. That is, he only finds a kind of petrified life and falls back into the prison of the traditional spirit, i.e. the father. The next brother goes to the left and finds a whore who has a mechanical bed to which she invites him. Having jumped out of it herself, she presses a button, the bed turns over, and he falls into the cellar where there are a lot of other men all waiting in the dark. That's the fate of the one who goes to the left. Then comes the great Ivan, the hero of Russian fairy tales. When he gets to the signpost, he begins to cry and says that a poor fellow who has to go to death will find neither honor nor glory, but he gives his horse the whip and goes ahead. His horse dies and comes to life again, and he finds the witch and conquers her. Then he finds the princess, returns home, and becomes the czar. He has a normal, successful fairy tale career. He chooses to remain in the conflict, which seems like death to the ego, for ego consciousness wants to know what is ahead. So this is me in, you know, in that telephone booth in Siena, you know, talking to, you know, my mom about what I should do. I couldn't remain in the conflict and just say, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Let me just ride forward to death, you know. So I think that's really, really beautiful. So in reality, I'm just kind of going to jump in and out of this a little bit. The Pu'er does something much worse. He risks neither way completely. So to make a decision is to commit, to cut away the other options, and then you, 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 you make this kind of total risk. Um, so he arrests the process of life and gets stuck. That's what happens if we, can't, if we can't cut away, we can't tolerate the death of these other options. Um, uh, let's see, there's one other thing I love here. Everybody has in front of him a field of reality where he can work if he wants to. And the childish trick of saying, I would work if it were the right thing, is one of the many self-delusions of the Puer Eternus, by which he keeps within the mother and his megalomaniac identification with God, because the gods, as you know, do not work, except for Hephaestus. That is the drawback of getting in touch with reality, because in that way, one becomes limited. There are restrictions. One comes to the miserable human situation where one's hands are tied and it is not possible to do as one would like something which is particularly disagreeable to the puer. What one produces is always miserable compared to the fantasies one had lying in bed, dreaming about what one could do, what one would do if one could. So here's the importance of having the courage to cut away those other options and make a decision because otherwise you get stuck. Yes, I, I love that. Um, actually having the imperfect eggs in your mouth when you're chewing actually allows you to get any kind of nutrition Yes. versus just thinking that we're satisfied um, fantasizing about one thing or another. That uh, She's so great. <laughs> He's such a clear thinking yeah. master in that regard. Yep. Yep. So, so coming uh, full circle, just in terms of um, unpacking a little bit of what goes on in, inside of us or what has to go on, there is something about the decision that is we start in some form of contemplation. And that decision has something to do with action. And as you were saying, once we take an action, immediately it implies that we're not acting in other ways. That any action in that moment sets aside all the other possible actions. So it's something about allowing something to concretize, which I think is what von Franz is saying, versus the fluidity inside of us. So. There is that magical moment where an internal deliberation crystallizes or coagulates into an external commitment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the magic 
in that. So that coagulatio, which is still mysterious, you know, in the same way that you can dissolve sugar into boiling water, and if you did this as a kid, you'll drop a string into it, and then over several hours, the sugar crystals will begin to accrete on the, on the string as it cools off. And there is a secret pattern that is coagulating that you can't see when it's in the solution. So something needs to, to make that change from the ever-changing fantasy world into the coagulating reality. And there is a way in which, you know, there's, there's something about uh, instincts and intuition and a rational analysis in terms of what's even an option and our values broader life context are all chirping in the background. But it is that idea of the absolute external commitment. It's the moment before your hand actually moves that you've made the decision. And it could be something as simple as take that bite of food and you swallow it. <laughs> it's the action that now is has happened and cannot be undone. And that's the way toward more life. And that's the little bit of a paradox, is just like in the fairy tale, the right answer is to choose death. Mm. That's what leads to more life. And if you allow uh, the fantasies to die, if you allow the version of yourself as you exist now to die, if you allow your certainty to die, if you allow those other options to die, you decide, you kill off those other options, then that leads to more growth. It does. And more life. So that we're ending here with this sobriety yeah. about decisions, that there's nothing giddy necessarily. There's something just sober and nutritious about <laughs> the decision. Yeah. 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 And um as we go into the dream, Joseph, would you like to read it? Yes, that would be great. Today's dreamer is a 37-year-old male who is a freelance artist, and he titles this dream The Flooded Pyramid. I was inside a large pyramid with a small group of unknown people whilst the whole earth was flooding with water. We were all treading water whilst the pyramid filled up, grasping for any ledge or surface we could. It finally filled high enough to reach the very top platform and we all climbed on. A large set of double doors opened immediately. I rushed through and began to free fall to the bottom. I felt like the other people knew what was on the other side of those doors, so they waited. I awoke before I hit the bottom. For context, he writes, my partner and I are in the process of starting a new business alongside our current jobs. He says the main feelings in the dream were equal parts panic and determination, disappointment after rushing through the doors, and then a few associations, he notes. I didn't know any of the other people. I have an interest in ancient history, and I'm not overly fond of water, or am I a confident swimmer? So I'm, I'm sort of assuming this is like an Egyptian pyramid because he referenced ancient history. So, um, so it's a sacred place. It's a tomb. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the interesting thing about a pyramid is that it would begin to feel faster and, sorry, it would begin to fill faster and faster because of its shape. Mm -hmm. So it would take a while to fill the bottom, but as the water gets higher, it would, it would become, you know, it would increase the rate at which it was filling. And also, um, you know, you'd be, you'd be really kind of squished toward the end. You'd be squeezed up into, uh, you know, a smaller space. Just think about the nature of the space inside a pyramid. I'm thinking about 
that I'm thinking about the paradox that you know from from the base you know we can't see high enough we can't see the opportunities that might be there that while we're tolerating the anxiety of the growing tension of the rising waters it's also lifting us upward in a way that we couldn't on our own which then allows this more thorough examination of each layer as there is a rising Mm-hmm. So the ego can't get itself up higher. It needs some other mysterious substance, the unconscious maybe. Maybe it's feeling states, or maybe it's literally even his own panic. Yeah. That the confinement, the desperation, the panic allows him to kind of elevate a bit where he then can finally see this platform and double doors and an opportunity mm-hmm. so the panic this re- reminds me very much of procrastination you know that putting it off putting it off putting off and then finally the consequences are so awful that that rising water of panic pops you over to a ledge and you can walk through a door and do the thing we've been putting off for god knows how long but then because we've We've used panic to get us up to the opportunity. We also think it can be highly impulsive and rush. Yep, yep. Because we're still carrying the panic that got us to the moment of decision. Mm -hmm. So how we get there matters. Yeah, I mean, because he says he's disappointed at rushing through the, the doors and he kind of feels like it was, you get the sense he feels like it was precipitous because everyone else was kind of waiting. So that he may have jumped before he needed to, mm-hmm. or something, you know, or there somehow it was, uh, you know, like you're saying, it was kind of ins- instigated by by panic, and there therefore wasn't wasn't considered. And of course, it this dream does not have a good resolution. It's um, it's sort of you know what, what would I say about the 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 resolution of this dream? I mean, it, it there, there's a sense that he did the wrong thing. I think that's you know when he says there's disappointment. It's like oh, everyone else waited. I jumped through the doors, um, and the sense that maybe this isn't going to particularly end well. He's in free fall, but but you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So if I if we're thinking about you know this dream, this dream's a little bit like you might want to work on your attitude. Because if you keep going the way you're going, it might not work out so well. Yeah, that perhaps if this is related to the new business venture, that the amount of anxiety and perhaps the claustrophobia, Mm -hmm. which comes to what we were saying, that you have to begin to make decisions in order for anything to take form. Yeah. So everything is, is moving to this smaller and smaller triangle at the top of the pyramid which is really how a venture does get launched. You're, you're not selling every product. You're not providing every service. It becomes condensed into something very specific. But again, the, um, the unconscious feeling of panic and claustrophobia and this wanting more space, wanting more options is a way, I think, of, of um, the claustrophobic demand to get out to the larger space builds and builds, and then just as we said, that catapults him out the door instead of standing on the ledge and evaluating the options, one of which is the water is also going to be going to begin to drain outside the door if you're concerned about the rising water. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the bottom was. I wish he was here. Is this the, the bottom of another area in the pyramid that's dry? Is it the bottom of the desert floor? But there isn't the cushioning water. He's not diving into a pool that could safely buoy him. So now he's subject to gravity in a way that's going to get his feet on the ground. Um, right. Yeah, and I'd be curious. I, I agree. This would be one of those dreams that would be helpful if he were, well, it would, it's always helpful to have the dreamer there. But, but I'm wondering, so what's the fate of the people who remain? Do we have a sense of that? Um, what do you make of the fact that it's a pyramid? I mean, we mentioned that it's a tomb, that it's a sacred space, but it's not a highly specific image. What, what comes up for you around that? Yeah, I liked what you said about it being a tomb. 
and it has something to do with the storage of resources for the afterlife. Yes. So there, there's something about a, a promise of a better thing on the far side, mm -hmm. but it is very magical, it's very mystical. Um, one, one has to have an awful lot of faith that whatever is uh, resourced into the pyramid is in fact going to carry you into this good future, in this future life, the next life. Um, I wonder if there's something about the, for instance, if we think it's about the collaboration, that there's something about the collaboration for him that carries a quality of death. And claustrophobia is often a feeling of death, that I'm going to suffocate. Mm -hmm. So to realize, you know, that I feel as if this venture is me living in a crypt and, and whatever one's associations are to that, that could lead us into a kind of a cloying desperation mm -hmm. to escape. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a particularly gruesome sort of image that you're, you know, I've, we've seen it in movies and stuff where you, you the cavers are in an underground water and the water's rising and there's only this much space and you know it like eventually you you know if the water rises all the way to the top you're a goner so um that that sense of kind of ri something rising and it's interesting that it's water so you know i do wonder if it's a big wave of feeling somehow or somehow connected to the emotional life that that's uh, really threatening to pull him under there's a possibility that the intimacy of, of the partnership and then going into a business, that there's a threat of regression. That he's going to go into this business, he's suddenly feeling younger and younger. The partner is in his mind is going to take on more and more authority and more of a parental role. And he's going to be engulfed in some kind of a childlike state, which is frightening. Mm-hmm. And is he's in a bit of a panic around this issue of autonomy uh, versus cooperation and collaboration. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very interested to know about those developmental experiences in his own childhood. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think that's an, a really interesting thing to bring up. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.